Hello and welcome. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today's subject is incident exploration with our very good friend David Rosenblatt. Good uh, afternoon, David. How are you doing? Hello, everybody. I'm doing fine. Thank you, Simon. Good. And just let the audience know where, where you're joining us from today, as we do. Can you, uh, sorry, David, can you just tell the audience where you're joining from today? Oh, yes. I thought you were talking to the audience. Tell him to, to put in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, broadcasting today from Israel, near, near Tel Aviv. Very nice. And I'm in uh, sunny Manchester. And you tell us where you're joining from, uh, literally. Can you see that, David? Uh, North Carolina, Greenland. Welcome, Clanet. I've not seen Greenland before, but you're very welcome. Welcome, everybody, wherever you're from. We're going to have a great uh, session with David. We always do. But before that, I'm going to play the sponsors' ads, and uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. back thanks to the sponsors uh all right get the slides up uh, i'll be back to join david with the q a later but for now all to david okay where's my next button let me just turn my video off hello everybody and let's see if my next button is working okay so let's go back so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is David Rosenblatt, and I am very passionate about this specific subject, incident exploration. And, and I chose the name in order not to use the word investigation, and I'll tell you why in a second. But 
it's really important for us to look at this type of work as an exploration, as an expedition to try to find out what went wrong. Most of my lectures talk about how to prevent things from going wrong. And if you've heard my lectures in the past, and there have been many of them, and this is a different situation where we say, okay, well, something bad happened. Uh, we had a recall, we had a terrible customer complaint, and we want to learn from it. We want to make sure it never happens again and nothing similar to it ever happens again. So, which is why we need incident explorations or investigations. And there are, there is a difference that I'll be mentioning. It's worth noting that this topic is applicable for any type of incident, not only food safety. I will be giving examples of talking about food safety because we are the IFSQN, but I am involved in incident exploration for various different types of incidents, mostly, of course, food safety because that's my main business, but also employee accidents and environmental issues and other things that go wrong. The methodology and the ideas are going to be identical. Another thing I want to say before we start, before we, we go out, we, we start is to learn how to properly perform an incident exploration, uh, we deliver a three-day course for, uh, ex for explorers, for people to be trained to do that. So lower your expectations as far as what you're going to take home. Uh, I, what I want to do in this short hour that we have is mention three major advances that we've seen in the last few years in incident exploration that we've been doing differently than we used to do in the past that are in addition to the traditional root cause analysis, Ishikawa, fishbone, and other types of problem-solving methodologies that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We use any of those, and I want to make just three major points. I'll, I'll be talking about the whole process, but I'm emphasizing three issues that are often overlooked and are very, very beneficial in doing this. So that's just that, that being said, I want to start with an example of an incident and its investigation. Um, so next slide. This is an, uh, uh, I want to talk about an investigation of a, a airplane accident that happened, air crash that happened in October, 1999. Uh, and um, Simon is going to show you a short video about a news clip from the incident, and then we'll talk about the investigation. No fear, no guilt. This is a very dear price to pay because often people are to blame, are guilty, but when we're doing an exploration, we have to be able to, as managers, say, I'm going to allow this and not punish this person because I don't want a culture of people not speaking their minds, not being transparent when I want to learn from mistakes. So our message in the company is anybody can make a mistake, anything can go wrong. We'd rather it didn't. We'd rather everybody work according to procedure and everything goes fine. But when things do happen, we are not going to get mad at you. We're going to find out how it happened, what went wrong, make it better so that never happens again. And we're going to, instead of punish you, we're going to support you, whoever was involved. Of course, of course, if any criminal action is detected throughout an, a, a, an exploration, of course, then we stop our part of the job and we have to give it to the authorities to find out what was done criminally and people have to pay the price because we're not going to cover for criminal behavior. But if it's normative behavior and it's just a matter of not following procedure for any reason we're going to find out or a procedure, that, a procedure that has not been identified, then we want to learn from it. Okay, so let's talk about the sequence of events uh, for incident exploration. This is a uh, pretty straightforward model. One, you must decide to do an exploration, and it has to be written in the procedures of the company what incidents justify an exploration and what don't. And this is uh, actually required in ISO 9001 when we have a nonconformity. We're expected to try to figure out which nonconformities justify corrective action and which don't. And the ones that do justify corrective action, we'll have to decide if we need an exploration uh, uh, process or not, depending on the complexity, depending on the severity. So it's a decision to be made. Once we've decided that we are going to explore this specific incident, then we plan for that. We have to choose who's going to 
participate. We have to choose where it's going to be, where it's taking place. Uh, we have, you know, have a meeting room and so forth, who we're going to invite and at what date. And then we'll collect evidence prior to doing the investigation itself or the exploration. Evidence collection is a, a lesson among its uh, on its own. I don't have time to tell to to go into the intric the intricacy of, of of evidence collection, but it's very similar to the type of evidence we'll collect in an internal audit. So objective evidence by talking to people, looking at the scene, looking at photographs, looking at documents, and getting as much objective evidence as possible. And then we'll analyze the evidence by trying to understand what story it's telling us, putting together the pieces of fact to tell us what, exact, what exactly happened and why it happened. That's the analysis, which is the heart of the incident exploration sequence. And following that, of course, we have our corrective action, which is the actions to take that will remove the root causes to prevent recurrence. So that's the sequence. In this short lecture, I want to focus on the analysis part, which is also a sequential process, step by step. So we have our, we're, we're, we're sitting in our exploration meeting. All of the attendees have brought their evidence with them and we start the analysis. And this could take a few hours. It could take a few days, depending on the complexity. The first step is to write down the chain of events. Now, there, there, there are forms that are officially used uh, to document the process. Uh, it has the date, who's, you know, whoever is participating, and so forth. So there are regular forms that most organizations have. And the first part of the form is write down the chain of events. Write down a logbook of what happened when. Get things straight, what the story is. And then ask what I call the big question. This is one of the things that I mentioned that we're not going to find in traditional methodologies, but you're going to hear it, hear it here for the first time. The big question is, did we or did we not anticipate this specific event from happening or to, would we anticipate it happening or not? That's the big question. It's a really, really important question. Had we foreseen it or not? And depending on the result of the big question, the third step will be to revisit the risk assessment. And the assumption is that if we did a good risk assessment, then whatever we are now investigating or exploring had been identified, its potential has been identified, written down, and we know it could have happened, and it happened anyway. If we miss that, then we'll have to revisit our risk assessment and figure out what happened with the risk assessment. And revisiting the risk assessment is the most important novelty that I'm going to be including in this session because it is not part of your traditional regular root cause analysis because not every organization always has risk assessments. But organizations that follow any management system now from, night, from 2015 and on must perform a risk assessment. Not only HACCP or HARPC, uh, food, uh, a, a, a food safety risk assessment, which is what I'm referring to here because we're talking about food safety, but also your ISO 9001 or ISO 45001 or 14001, they all require risk assessments for their own agenda. I lost my mouse. There we are. Once we've done all that, then we start identifying major faults. The major faults are the major things that went wrong. What went wrong? And there are usually a few of them, three, four, five major faults. Once we know our major faults, then we do the RCA, the root cause analysis, fault by fault to figure out what was the root cause of that fault. So that is the analysis part. Once we know the root cause, of course, then we can move on to our corrective action and put corrective actions in place to remove those root causes so that we won't, uh, so there will be no recurrence. So let's talk about the big question. Did our risk assessment fail, yes or no? Again, the concept is that we should not be exploring this incident that happened because it should not have happened. It happened because something went wrong. And the first question is, did anybody anticipate that this could happen? And, and what did we do about it? 
So the big question is actually a sequence of questions that lead us to conclusions in a very mathematical fashion. I want to remind you that any risk assessment is based on three major processes, identification of potential hazards, evaluation of those hazards in order to decide is the hazard significant or not significant, and once we have our significant hazards, then we choose control. This is how HACCP and HARPC all work, identify, evaluate, control. So in order for something to go wrong, we have to have failed either in identification, evaluation, or in control, which is why we have this sequence of questions to try to figure out if our risk assessment went wrong. So the first question that we'll ask is, was the potential hazard identified? The thing that has happened to us that we are now trying to figure out how it happened, was it identified in our risk assessment? If no, then we must go back to the risk assessment and, of course, retroactively now, identify it and fix the risk assessment, and that will lead us to whatever needs to be done to prevent recurrence. If the answer is yes, it was identified, then we must ask ourselves, has it been ranked as significant? If the answer is no, we go back to our risk assessment and ask ourselves the following question. If it was not ranked as significant, did we use valid tools to make that decision? Of course, significance, I'll remind you, is based on likelihood and severity. Were we, did we assess our likelihood correctly? Did we assess the severity correctly? Did we do the math correctly? And did we come to the right conclusion? Now, there are two possibilities. A, it really might, it might be that we did not rank this specific hazard as being significant, and we decided not to, not to uh, implement control. And that's what's called taking a calculated risk. And we do that all the time. Now, if we are now investigating a situation where our calculated risk actually happened, that does not mean that we were wrong. We took in consideration the possibility that something could go wrong. Based on likelihood and severity, we took we calculated the risk and we decided to take the calculated risk. That's all that's the essence of risk assessment. Otherwise, we'd always put in control measures for everything that could happen, all potential hazards will all be controlled, which is not the way we do business. We don't do that. So it really might be that we found that we were correct and we took a calculated risk and it happened. If that's the case, we might still want to reassess it. We might say, well, now that it happened, it, maybe we, st and we might say, no, we're, we, st we stand behind the decision. This is not severe enough or rare enough to justify the decision. So that's taking a calculated risk. The other case is B, yeah, we got it wrong. We got it wrong. We didn't figure that it was as severe as it really was. We missed that, or it was more common than we would have thought it, would, it was. So we missed that severe, that the, the, the likelihood. Therefore, the total risk was lower than it should have been. And that's why we have to go back to risk assessment. We have to redo it, reassess it. And whatever we decide to do will be the corrective action for that specific incident. Now, if the answer is yes, the third question is, was were control measures chosen? The answer should always be yes. But in case control measures were not chosen, of course, we must go back to the risk assessment. This is a very uncommon situation. I've seen it happen, but it's not very common that an organization identifies a potential hazard, evaluates it to be significant, and then does not put a control measure in place. And then that ha and then it happens. And then whatever they for whatever they had. Uh, prophesized to happen happens so that's not good so in all of these three cases this is these are the cases where our risk assessment didn't work and we go back to the risk assessment and redo it when we revise our risk assessment which is actually the corrective action that must be done if we figured out that our risk assessment failed to prevent whatever we are now investigating we must not just revise the risk assessment, but we have to get to the to the root cause, and we must reevaluate re the food safety team competence. I have participated in incident explorations where our conclusion was that the risk assessment missed whatever we are now exploring, whatever had happened, and when we looked at the at the food safety team who had made the decisions, they were not competent. They didn't have the tools. They weren't 
savvy enough in the methodology, and they missed it. So they're not bad people. They just were not competent enough. Usually, I'll try to look for this when I do an audit in order to prevent this type of thing from happening. And often, I, and I've spoken about this in other courses, in other lectures, that sometimes we, during an audit, when I speak to the food safety team and the food safety leader, I identify that they're not uh, competent enough in, in, in the material, and I will uh, give a nonconformity to that before something happens. So we must reevaluate the competence of the, of the food safety team and also look for similar blind spots. Probably, if that happened, other things have gone wrong. They've missed other stuff. So this is an, an, it's an opportunity to prevent things that haven't happened yet from happening. And all food safety teams in the organization, if it is an organization that has more than one food safety team, as many organizations do, should this should be communicated to all of them because they also may be suffering from similar blind spots. So that is our back to the risk assessment uh, algorithm. Now, if it's yes, 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 so we identify the hazard, we rank it as being significant, and we put a control measure in place, then we must ask ourselves, were control measures implemented as planned? And this is the question saying, in, other, in wording in another way is, had everybody worked according to procedure, would this have happened? Yes or no? So we have a control measure in place. Was it implemented? Now, I just want to... Uh, um, Go back to the work control measures chosen. I use the term control measures as it is defined in ISO 22000. In parentheses, I wrote PCs, which are preventive controls. Preventive controls are the control measures as they are described in FISMA. So same, same, but it depends what country you're in and what language you're speaking. When you're talking about the control measures, what I'm talking about are the CCPs, the OPRPs, the risk preventive controls, those elements of our, what we call our food safety plan or food safety system that are the control measures. So were they implemented as planned? If the answer is yes, then we have a validation fault. Meaning that if we identified a hazard, we recognized that we, 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 risked, we ranked it as being significant and we put a control measure in place and it was implemented as planned, then we shouldn't be sitting here talking about this right now. It doesn't make sense. What went wrong was that the control measure failed, being implemented as planned, which means we had a problem with our validation. And validation is making sure that any control measure we choose is capable of either preventing or reducing the hazard that was identified. That's what validation means. So this is where we find our validation fault. By now, you should be screaming, that's what happened to the Learjet. That's what happened to the Learjet. That was what that because on the Learjet, everybody followed procedure and they all died. So it is not a, it's not an issue of non-compliance or or not non-discipline as we see in many cases that we're going to be talking about from now on. But people follow procedure. There are other food safety incidents. There are food safety incidents, incidents, famous ones that that's what happened. One of the most interesting ones I've mentioned in other in other uh, uh, talks is the maple leaf incident um, of 2009 in Canada with Listeria monocytogenes. The investigation found that everybody worked according to procedure in that factory, and it was a cleaning issue. And the system of cleaning, its validation apparently wasn't uh, robust enough because it didn't uh, it didn't prevent the listeria monocytogenes. Nobody was at fault. Nobody got in trouble. It was very very sad, very unfortunate, and the whole industry learned from this. So there are incidents where we assume that our control measures are going to control the hazard if we all work according to our planned procedures and it doesn't happen. So we have to look at our validations very carefully to make sure that we can prove that what we think is going to happen is actually going to happen. If control measures were not implemented as planned, then we have a human factor issue. And because the fact is, had they worked according to procedure, it would not have happened because everything would have, would have worked if it was in place. People didn't do what they were supposed to do. Something went wrong with human beings. If this is the case, then we're going to have to write that down in our report. Now, this is where I'm going to stress 
the second major contribution of what's new in risk assessments. Because in the old days, when we used to do, uh, well, not risk assessments, I apologize, um, incident uh, uh, explorations. What we used to do is do root cause analysis, and if the bottom of the root cause analysis was that somebody didn't do what they were supposed to do, we'd say, okay, the, our, our uh, conclusion is this is a human error, a human problem, and our corrective action is going to be either retrain or refresh the procedures, which is what I see all the time at the conclusions and corrective actions of incident explorations that I that I read when people uh, ask me for my opinion. Over and over again, we see this. And often, most times from my experience, retraining people or refreshing the procedures is not going to prevent recurrence. The reason being that the root cause was not that people didn't know what to do. So if you tell them again, it's not going to make a difference. And there are many, many, many examples of incidents where training was not an issue at all, but they retrained anyway, because that is our uh, automatic reflex when people go, go wrong and then we retrain them and we document it. And this is a mistake. So the one of the most important things in a good exploration is to try to get to the bottom of human factors. And I'm going to refer you back to several of my previous talks, which are, of course, on the IFSQN uh, website, talking about culture and about human factors. And I'm not going to go through the whole issue, but we have identified that whenever somebody does not work according to procedure, procedure was not met, it is caused by one of three major issues. So it's either a human error or forgetfulness issue, or a competence issue, or a motivation issue. And there are no other reasons that somebody will not follow a procedure. If you find another reason, let me know. I will update the model. So far, 100% of people who do something different than what's written on the, in the procedure is either one of these three. Now, each one of them, of course, is a world of understanding, that must be addressed. But first, we have to get it clear. Now, often, we won't be able to do that 100%. What I call trying to find the root cause of human factors with, with surgical precision is what we want to try to do. Sometimes, we won't be able to get to the bottom of it. If I have a guy telling me, and you know, for instance, somebody, um, we have a recall, metal fragments, we have a metal detector, turns out the metal detector was not working in that shift, and the guy who was supposedly supposed to test the metal detector to make sure it was working didn't test the metal detector. That's what we find upon our exploration. And we say to the guy, why did you, do you know that there is a procedure that mandates you to test the metal detector every two hours? And he says, yeah, I know. Um, no, and he says, you know what, I, uh, I, I forgot. I'm sorry. I know, but I forgot. I have so much things on my mind, so many things on my mind, and I forgot. So more or less, I'm stuck there. And it will be classified as human error or forgetfulness because I have to take his word for it. I cannot go into his brain. I'm not going to torture him to see if he's telling the truth or not. But in fact, this may be a person who couldn't give a damn, didn't think it was important enough, didn't care that much, and decided not to test the metal detector, but then when he was faced with the fact that he was uh, he he was the cause of a recall, he'll say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. What are you going to do to me?" In this case, what what I do is I say, "Well, you know, people, you know, make mistakes, and and we'll have to figure out a way to prevent that from happening again." But I want I want to ask you, um, can you tell me? Uh, do you understand? why it's so important, try to just make sure that that person has at least the potential to be motivated. I'm saying this because when we look at motivation, one of the reasons for people not performing, not working according to, to procedure and causing food safety incidents is that they don't fully understand the outcome. They don't understand what could go wrong if they don't follow procedure. They're not aware of the magnitude of, it, of the importance. And Actually, you've seen ISO 9001 and ISO 22000 add recently, in the recent versions, add 
the requirement for awareness on top of competence to make sure people understand why they have to do what they do. This is the reason why. And it's a whole issue of making sure that everybody understands why they're told to do something, which will make their motivation higher. But So sometimes we'll get to the bottom, sometimes we won't. If we figure out there's human error forgetfulness issue, we might want to look in our processes and see what went wrong there. Um, maybe we need Pokayoke to be implemented. Maybe we want to use a checklist. Maybe we need some other means of refreshing uh, when things can be forgotten and so forth. And there are a lot of, there's a lot to do in this area if we find out that was what went wrong. If it's a competence issue, we must look at what type of competence, what went wrong, and, and then we drill down further. We have one more level of competence, meaning is it a knowledge issue or a capability issue? Because sometimes you can know what you're supposed to do and not be able to do it because you're not capable. So knowledge, and if you don't know, there's no point in being capable. So we need both. If it's a knowledge issue, the person says, I didn't know that. I couldn't do that. I didn't know that I was supposed to have done that. I had no idea. And then we must revisit our training, our learning processes. How do we teach people to know stuff? How do we verify that they know what they're supposed to know? What tools are we using? And then that is one of the only cases where retraining is relevant but it's not just retraining. It's also revisiting our training techniques. How is it possible that if this person was trained but still doesn't know, is it a language issue? Is it a delivery issue? What's going on there? And and once we spoke about that, then we want to also find out maybe it was an issue of capability. Maybe the person is not capable. And, this, and there are two types of capability issues. One is personal. I can't do it because I am not whatever enough proficient enough, skilled enough, experienced enough, intelligent enough, strong enough, I don't know. But I can't do it because I am not capable, and that's the situation. Or it may be an organizational capability issue. I don't have the resources to do what I'm supposed to do, therefore I didn't. I don't have the time, I don't have the manpower, I don't have the tools, I don't have the materials. Something is missing that I don't have, and therefore I did something else. So it's a capability issue. If we've identified that we had foreseen this incident because in our risk assessment and there were control measures and they weren't implemented, and our and our conclusion is upon invest when we talk to the people and interview them and our exploration goes deeper, we find out that it was a capability issue. We should tend to that. We should look at how we can improve that and prevent it from happening again. But we must also understand that that's also a validation fault. Because validation includes validating that everything that we decide to do is also doable. Not only is it effective, which is the first part of validation, will it work? The second question is, can it work? Will it work? Not only is it possible, not only is it valid scientifically, and that's an important question. If had the people who wrote the procedure, the emergency procedure for the Learjet, validated, but how? How do you validate that kind of thing? Well, you're not going to uh, figure it out when you're the plane's in the sky in an emergency situation. What you do is you simulate emergency situations. So have the pilots come into a simulator, have them practice the different types of emergency situations and see what would happen. And then they would have figured out, the guys would have said, hey, you know, it's by the time we get to this, we're going to be dead. Let's switch it around, which is what they did in the end anyway, which seems so obvious. Now, this is a really important example because you might have expected the pilot and co-pilot to use common sense. You need somebody to tell you to put on an oxygen mask? Where is your common sense? What's wrong with you? But that is the price we pay when we have a management system, and it's a price we're willing to pay. The price to pay is that everybody works according to procedure, and you do not decide what to do on, yourself, on your own. I don't want people making decisions. I want people to be clear on what they have to, be, on what they have to do, especially when we're talking about public safety and public health. So with, that's why as soon as we tell people, do exactly what's written in the procedure, do not revert to your instincts. You must act by procedure. 
the burden of responsibility on those writing the procedures is enormous because these people are going to comply even if it costs them their lives. So it's worth a discussion. At the end of the discussion, if we had it, we don't have time to have it. I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, then people should do work with intuition. I will have convinced you that that is not a good alternative. The number of times that we're going to have people die because somebody made their own decision because they didn't agree with what the procedure said is going to be much, much higher than the opposite. So to keep that in mind. Now, I lost my mouse again. Here it is. Okay. So now we're at our root cause analysis. And we have our major faults. We've identified them. We know where they are. We know if it was a uh, an issue that should have been identified in our risk assessment. Maybe it was some kind of failure. Maybe it was human error. Maybe it was, in, it was a comp. Whatever it is, we now have our major faults. And now we proceed to our root cause analysis. So and the root cause analysis is the classic Everybody studied it. Everybody's been exposed to it. We've been using it for years and years. I've been doing food safety for 30 years. But 10 years before that, and I'm not talking about 40 years ago, I did root cause analysis in the Air Force. I was in the Israeli Air Force um, in training academy. And we did, we did root cause analysis, and nothing's changed. The ideas are the same. You must get to the root cause by asking yourself why, 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 why. We've seen many methodologies along the way. Uh, Demayak, 5M, whatever. There are a lot of great methodologies out there, but they're all based on the same idea that every fault has a cause, every cause has a sub-cause, every sub-cause has a sub-cause, and until you get to the root cause, you're not going to prevent recurrence. The only thing that I'm going to add on to that today is a concept that we don't see often enough that's really, really important in food safety uh, uh, incident explorations. So, root cause analysis. We have our symptoms, which is what we found it happened, and we have the problem that caused it, and then we have the causes that caused the problem. If we want to get rid of the symptoms, we must remove the causes. Pretty straightforward. So, a non-conforming situation or fault always has underlying contributing causes. We have our fault, and then we have our direct causes, then we have our indirect causes, and then we have our root causes. There's myth. There's a myth that it, that there's a magic number five. That's why there's the five Y model. Y, 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 Y. And the fifth Y hit the root cause. That is arbitrary. There's nothing magical about the number five. You could hit your root cause at seven, at 15, or at three. It depends on the situation. There's nothing mystical about five. But it is a well-known, recognized uh, tool, the five Y. So let's say that we have salmonella contamination of a, of a finished product. That was found either by a recall or a customer complaint or Ministry of Health or whatever. It doesn't make a difference. We have our, that is our fault. That's what happened. So we ask ourselves, what is the direct cause? In this case, the investigation leads to the fact that there was a leaky ceiling and water from the roof that had salmonella in it had leaked onto the product. This is a actual, an actual case, uh, okay, actual case study. I'm not going to name names because this specific ch chain of events was not publicized. Um, and then we, why is the ceiling leaking? Well, we find that there are clogged rain gutters that allowed water to accumulate in the gutters, rainwater with uh, bird droppings that caused a salmonella soup, and the water found its way into the, into the uh, path of least uh, resistance and dripped onto the product in the plant. And why were the clogged rain gutters? then, well, we have to find out. We have to figure it out. We have to find out why that didn't happen. We may use the 5M model as an example, which is machine, man, method, material, measurement. So was our, did somebody not follow procedure? Was the procedure not adequate? Was the tools that were afforded to, to the cleaning of the gutters not the, not the proper tools? What went wrong there? Which is, and in this case, you can use your Ishikawa fishbone. You can use your Demayek. You can use your all types of methodologies that you like or just use common sense and try to figure out what were the root causes. Of course, if it was a human, if it was a man issue, we do want to use that surgical precision to figure out what exactly went wrong. Was it a motivation issue? Was it a human error issue or forgetfulness? Or was this a competence issue? So the traditional RCA, the traditional, traditional RCA methodology involves asking the question, why, until we reach the root causes? Why, 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 why? Um, However, and this is a big however, 
if the organization has a management system, it must split the why into two RCAs, two requests. And this is the the third take home novel issue that we're that I'm trying to present here because I've, I've mentioned because so far I've mentioned the fact that we want to revisit our risk assessment, which is usually not done in traditional risk uh, uh, analysis or investigations. Usually we skip the part of the risk assessment for some reason, which is a major issue. The second was that we want to try to find the human factor with surgical precision using modern models of behavior, like the theory of, of motivation, competence, and human error. And the third is this. The third is splitting the whys into two root cause analysis, which is very seldomly done. And that's unfortunate because we miss a lot of blind spots and prevention of recurrence by not doing that. And it's really easy to do. So the way it works is you say, A, why did it happen? Why, 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 why? Like I showed you with the salmonella. And B, why wasn't it prevented? Which is a really important question. And it is relevant to organizations that have a management system. Because what is a management system? It is a system that has tools in place and processes in place that are going to protect us from ourselves over and over again. So uh, a great example is um, a glass break issue, uh, foreign glass foreign bodies because of breakage in the plant. Now, the, the first and foremost uh, requirement is do not bring glass or brittle plastic into a production area if you don't need it there. So you don't bring in glasses and stuff, so that's fine. And the second is if anything ever breaks, you must initiate your glass break procedure and then follow that glass break procedure by the book so that everything's cleaned up and put aside and whatever is written on our glass procedure and documented and so forth. Now, if everybody follows those two major basic procedures, then we will never, ever, ever have a glass issue. However, we know that no one control is effective, so we add on to that our glass and brittle plastic uh, surveillance, our uh, review, our whatever we do every once in a while, we'll, we'll do our survey of the glass and brittle plastic once a day, once a week, once a month, depending on the proximity of, the, of those hazards to our open products, which is now a standard procedure for most organizations that have a management system. So these are redundancies. Why do we have preventive maintenance and we may be doing a checklist of uh, of, P of, of metal parts that could break off of a packaging machine, and we also have our metal detector. So we have measures that are on top of measures. Now, we also have, for instance, this guy that did not test the metal detector and got everybody in trouble. Well, there's also what we call, if the metal detector is a CCP, it should have been verified, this verification. Where was the verification? Is it possible that over many, many months, this person was not properly testing the metal detector and nobody figured it out, nobody found out? Do not, don't we have any procedures in place to verify that what we think is happening is actually happening? So why wasn't it prevented is a really important question. So now if we have, for instance, salmonella contamination, leaky ceiling, clogged rain gutters, uh, and we find out when we do our risk assessment the root causes that the gutter cleaning was not performed according to procedure. Okay? And then we'll take that and try to find out, do our our human error uh, evaluation. We'll talk to the people who are supposed to do it and try to figure out what happened. Had, did they forget to do it? Did they not care about it? Did they decide it's not that important? Did they not have time to do it? Were they not given the tools to do it? Is it a, this may be a procedure that requires uh, uh, work at height, um, special permit, and that is not available to them. They may not have their lifelines. Something went, whatever went wrong, we'll have to figure out why. It's, it wouldn't be uh, sufficient to just retrain everybody about how important it is to clean the gutters. So that is the, that issue. But, but also we must be asking ourselves, why wasn't it prevented or detected? What else went wrong? We can't just end our risk assessment, our uh, incident exploration at the root cause of what, whatever caused them not to do the procedure. Of course, of course, had they followed procedure, we would not have salmonella contamination. That is, of course, true. And once we get rid of the root cause, we will have prevented recurrence as required. But that's not enough. Did we actually learn something? Which is why we must ask ourselves more questions. For instance, 
why didn't the maintenance team report that they had a capacity problem? Because they're saying, hey, we didn't do it because um, we're sorry, we wanted to get to it, but it was postponed because we don't have enough people right now. We have, you know, we have one guy who didn't show up and we don't have enough people, so we postponed it. That's why we didn't follow procedure. That's the story. So now we must, well, why didn't they report that they had a capacity problem? How come they didn't tell anybody? One of the things, and of course, if that were the case in this this example, this case study, then people are saying, well, we want, we knew we had to clean the gutters. We are totally capable of doing it. We did not do it because we didn't have enough people. We didn't have enough time. We didn't get around to it. On schedule, we postponed it for one month. This is one type of of maintenance task that you cannot postpone because it's seasonal. It's connected to the season. We have a rain season. We have the rains coming. We must take care of it on time. So that would we call out a competence issue. We say, okay, well, we figured out that it's why is it competence? Because if we go back to the algorithm, they had the total knowledge, they were totally motivated, they had not forgotten, they didn't make a mistake, they just couldn't do it because it was an issue that they didn't they couldn't they couldn't get around to it. One of the reasons that happens is a cultural issue that we've spoken about in other uh, talks that there is a concept in many organizations that it is not acceptable to complain when you don't have the resources to do something. You're expected to do it anyway. Where there's a will, there's a way. You're expected to figure it out. I don't want, I, I as a manager don't want to hear you whining about how difficult life is for you. You do get your job done, whatever it takes. And therefore, people will not shout out so that's a question. Why didn't you report? So I'd ask them that. They said, oh, yeah, right. Like somebody's going to listen to us. Like somebody cares that we don't have enough people. You serious? That is a really, really important finding in the exploration because we have a lot to work with now culturally. How, how many of our managers are open to hearing, hey, boss, I can't do that. It's too difficult for me. I don't have the people. I don't have the time. And how, how open are people to, how safe do people feel to be able to talk like that in the organization. So we have a cultural issue that is actually part of the solving the problem in that specific case. So that's a question that's relevant. Um, why did nobody discover that a crucial maintenance task was overdue? This is a crucial maintenance task. I'm sure it's managed on some kind of Excel sheet or some kind of uh, Oracle or, or, or ERP that people that are used to manage maintenance, it must be a task that's there. Does it, not, does it not have a red flag that it's overdue? Has it not been identified as requiring a red flag when it's overdue? Does nobody has does nobody have access to the red flags? Do quality assurance or management don't go do, don't they go over things that are overdue and they cause a hazard and have as a heads up? This is something we want to look into. Why did nobody discover that it was overdue? Why did nobody notice that the gutter was clogged? Do we, do we have any surveys? Nobody's walking around reviewing our infrastructure. Uh, nobody going on the roof and looking around every once in a while, see what's going on. Or And the same thing for the rest of the yard and our engine rooms and our production areas and our uh, uh, changing rooms and the dining room. We should have regular inspections going on that are performed by uh, uh, people who have been trained to do that. Did nobody notice it was clogged? Do we not have a regular surveillance in place, or is it not being done professionally? Why did nobody notice that the ceiling was leaking? How is that possible? Same question. Is our product sampling procedure sufficient? How did we get to the situation we have salmonella that went undetected? Well, it could happen, but maybe we could improve our sampling procedures. These questions are the questions that are associated with the question, with the split root cause analysis. Why wasn't it prevented or detected? Not only why did it happen? So take home points, effective learning from undesirable incidents requires a corporate culture of tolerance, no blame, no shame, no fear, no guilt, questioning and improving our risk assessments, identifying human factors with surgical precision, and finally splitting the why, like I just mentioned. So we have, uh, and I forgot I added that one, understanding that taking calculated risks is acceptable. So. And in some cases, not very often, I must say, not very often. I've seen very few cases, but I have seen them where the conclusion is, yeah, it happened. Yeah, we're sorry, but we wouldn't do anything different because that is what that's the risk we took. And we understood it could have happened. 
And that is a legitimate decision if I can back it, of course, with a valid risk assessment. So we have a few minutes for questions. I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm going to turn on my video. Right, Simon? That's what I'm supposed to do right now? Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thanks for that, David. Excellent presentation, as usual. Uh, and lots of questions. Um, starting with uh, Vinod, I'll highlight it in the sidebar for you, David, so you can see. Uh, in case of failure of our control measure, how can we revalidate and reassure to prevent the reoccurrence? Please clarify. Well, we have to figure out what went wrong with the control measure. If it failed, and everybody was working according to procedure, was maintained as it was, it was being operated and being maintained and being inspected and being monitored as as required. Then we have to understand that whatever we had chosen, whatever we chose was not valid, and we have to revalidate and improve. Of course, if everybody worked according to procedure, then it was a human error. So it's a pretty uh, methodological way of looking at a failure of a control measure, or it may have worked as as expected. I've said that. So for instance, a metal detector that is supposed to detect metal at a certain uh, size, and I get a terrible customer complaint with a lawsuit and somebody injured and blah, 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 because they got a metal particle in their food that was smaller than our metal detector's level of detection. This is a calculated risk that we took. So we may want to ask ourselves, is this the risk that we took? Was it worth taking? But that would also be a case. Okay, and another one from Vinod. Uh, whether we can we consider the environmental factors for root cause analysis? If if so, share please share your inputs. Definitely, and uh, when we and one of the uh, adaptations of the five M method is five M and an E. Environment is added onto that. Um, so of course, if there's an environmental factor that is that has impacted whatever went wrong, we'll be able to identify that as well. Okay, uh, one from Ahmed. Um, can you show me one example of root cause of a problem by fishbone? Well, yes, I'd love to. I have a lot of them, but our time is not. We don't have enough time for it. No. Uh, but it I just, just it would be, for instance, um, I'd put the fishbone out. The fishbone would have our main uh, part of the fish, and then little bones on the sides. And one would say, for instance, man, and then we'd say, okay. Um, so did everybody follow procedure? And then we said, well, no, somebody didn't follow procedure. And we said, why? It would go off the fish bone, and that bone would take us to a uh, human error issue. And then we'd ask ourselves, okay, well, did the machines work? And we say, okay, maybe not. And we'll go to the machine. So little by little, we'll get to the end of the bones, and we'll find our many different root causes. Uh, it's, of course, the fish bone just because it looks like a fish. Any other way of putting it on a on a piece of paper will, go, will, will work the same. Okay, and uh, Shiva, how do we motivate an, an individual employee where there is no support by higher management? The answer, Shiva, is it is impossible. I have a lot of experience, but I'm not a magician. Uh, if management are not supportive and are not committed, there's no point in talking to employees about anything, in my opinion, which is why in many cases I find myself working with high, with top management when, when as the result of an incident investigation. Um, one of our comments will be management we find to be not supportive and we'll talk to them. It's not because they're bad people or they're lazy. It's because some managers have risen to managerial positions without getting the proper training or tools. So it's worth uh, revisiting that as well. That's another blind spot that we find. Okay. And Tavia, please correct me if I'm wrong. However, I remember you saying that, for example, in ISO 9001, you you are to decide if you are to take action on nonconformity or not. Are you saying that we don't need to take action on all nonconformities? Yes and no. I understand the question. Now, if you go to the to item uh, the corrective action item uh, in ISO 9001 and 2000 as well, it says that whenever you have a case of nonconformity, you have to decide if preventing recurrence is necessary. And if it is, then you have to look at the root causes, which is the difference between doing a correction which is correcting whatever went wrong and getting on with your day or doing a corrective action, which is actually investigating what went wrong, getting to the root cause, preventing it from recurring. So there are two levels of nonconformity. Severe nonconformity requires, is that you're expected to identify that it's severe and it requires doing an investigation, getting rid of the root causes and preventing recurrence. Small nonconformities can be just handled as corrections. So that differentiation, that differentiation is made in order to be able to focus on the big issues and not 
what we not initiate a corrective action requirement for every correct for every little nonconformity. That's the answer to that, and it is it's written in the standard as such. Okay, Ying, uh, five the five wise approach seems tricky in the way of raising the questions. Is, is there any rule to follow? Any sort of tips? Um, no, it's a it's a well it's a weathered system that's been used by many people around the world very often. There's a lot of literature on it. Um, I myself use it marginally, uh, but I will, especially when I work with an organization that likes it as a consultant. If the if I go to an organization and I love the five M, then I'll I'll you know I'll, I'll do it with them. But if they if I use my consultancy, I will just use it marginally. Um, it's just a way of of categorizing the possible causes of something in a methodological manner in order to not overlook anything. But once you have enough experience over the years, you see everything. You don't need the five M's, but but it's a great yeah. it's a great tool. Yeah. Uh, Olu Wasun, uh, can we carry out incident exploration on equipment breakdown, hygiene, etc.? Anything. The question is on anything. Okay. Some of it. Sometimes it'll end up being very straightforward and short, and okay, we got it. And sometimes it'll become more and more elaborated, depending on what what went wrong. But of course. Okay, uh, Rimsha, this is literally one of the best webinars I have ever took. Thank you so oh, thank much you. for this presentation. It was really informative. That's good. Uh, slightly off topic, Sid Hartha, best criteria for um, selecting CCP. Oh, that's a that's that's from a different webinar, but the criteria it's really easy. Any control measure that is capable of either preventing or reducing the hazard to an acceptable level is worthy of being a CCP, if it is the best in its class, if it's the best available technology. So there are questions: what are the best CCP? Well, which one is better than the other one? When and it is choosing the best available technology that is capable and proven capable to reduce or prevent that specific hazard and that there therefore you have your CCP. Okay. If it's measurable and and monitorable. If it's not, then it's not a CCP. And that's a, go see the course the, the talk about OPRPs versus CCP. Uh, Julius, is there a standard matrix to use for risk analysis? The answer is yes. Um, there is a, uh, a standard uh, matrix called FMEA, it's Failure Mode Effect Analysis, FMEA, it's a 10 by 10 matrix, mostly used by engineers for anal anal analyzing engineering issues, but anybody can use it. I think it's a bit overboard. I think it's too much, 10 by 10. There are many, many others, but that's the only one that I know that is standardized. It's a standard uh, procedure that is written in, uh, uh, that is written down. All the other are, are used. Uh, Coca-Cola, Nestle, Unilever use five by fives. In their in their food safety risk assessments, um, other organizations have different standard uh, matrices, but the only one that I know is FMEA. Okay, uh, three questions, three more questions from uh, Vinod. How can we combine the requirements of uh, FISMA and ISO 22K for effective implementation of control measures to prevent food safety issues? Any example would be useful for better understanding? Okay, um, that's a it's a big question. I'll try to keep it short. Um, FISMA is a, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, and I'm trying to be very, very politically correct. FISMA has a lot, has a lot of inspiration from ISO 22000. ISO 22000 was written in, in, uh, 20, in 2005. FISMA was written in 2000 and from nine, between 2009 and 2011, and they did take inspiration from it. So in FISMA, you have four types of typical um, preventive controls. Yeah, process preventive controls, allergen preventive controls, sanitation preventive controls, and supply chain preventive controls. And the fifth would be the other. ISO, ISO 22000 has CCPs, which are the process preventive controls, and OPRPs, which are all the rest. So there is a so if you have an ISO 22000 system in place and you want to follow FISMA requirements, you're more or less done. You just have to put the terminology in place, um, and they are as effective as each other to prevent food safety issues, which is the good news. So they are both great systems for preventing. ISO 22000 being a voluntary certifiable standard has a higher, has, has a stricter requirements uh, in it. It's more difficult to meet the requirements of ISO 22000 because it's more elaborate, because it's, it's certifiable, but it gives the same effect, the same impact, in my, in my opinion. 
Okay. Finald, any guidelines or international standards available for risk assessment tools and models? If so, please share your thoughts. Yeah. Besides FMEA that I mentioned, um, I think there's a uh, public available specification from ISO, a PAS. I'm uh, I'm not sure that's called risk assessment. Um, it's worth looking into. It's a guideline. It's not certifiable. Um, thirty-three thousand. I know. I'm, I don't want to guess. I don't remember. Um, it's thirty something with threes in it, <laughs> besides FMEA, um, that that can be used as well. Okay, and Tamika, is it fair to include both corrections and corrective action on an NCR form? Best webinar ever. Well, thank you so much, Tamika. It is acceptable, um, but it is you sometimes will be too crowded you want you want to make sure that your ncr is is focused on things that really went wrong and other other things that can be handled outside of it should be handled outside of it but it's not going to be a mistake okay uh just one there from uh bernard codex alimentarius has a new has new requirements are you uh, is there a new issue of Codex Elementarius that you're aware yes, of? Yes, there's a new version of Codex um, that is worth making doing a webinar on. Uh, but it's nothing, there's no, uh, it's no revolution there. There's nothing, there's no fireworks. It's a progress, as Codex usually does, they're conservative, they progress as we go through the years. And every few years, they'll do a, a revision. They did a recent revision. Okay. And Vinod, again, uh, how can we ensure the effective competence and training in food manufacturing factory with employees from different countries and cultures? Um, in order to verify effectiveness of competence, we must do tests. I, I, find, I found, I don't know any other way, written examinations and oral examinations and observations to give people what we call qualification exams. So you pass your written exam, put together good questions, make it serious, analyze the results and then if it's if it's uh, relevant for that specific task also do an oral and a visual examination of a supervisor and the person gets their competence uh, uh, effectiveness and it can be done of course in any language language should not be a barrier uh, should not be a problem people should be trained in their in their mother tongue always Okay, and uh, a final one. I think we'll take this final one with 10 minutes past. Uh, what's the frequency of reviewing implemented risk assessments in high-risk <coughs> food manufacturing sectors? Um, that's pretty standard. Um, in most risk assessments, we do a revision every time something changes, any change, following any incident, and at least once a year. That's the, that's the classic answer. So most standards will require at least once a year but often there'll be a change or adaptations or things going on more often. So it'll be done more often, but if nothing happens once a year, that's the answer. Okay. Um, and just one more there from Inisha. I don't know if we, we can help with that at all, but I, I'm a master in food technology graduate and which was certified BRC GFSI. So can you please share some authentic online organizations for it? I'm finding it hard to choose from the ones showing on Google search. Is that anything your company does, uh, David? I'm not sure I understand the question. Does uh, Insha want to choose a certifying standard to, for their organization, or does she want to work for a certifying? I'm not sure I understand the I, question, I think Insha. it's training for uh, themselves to sort of specialize in uh, perhaps auditing training. I don't know yet. The best thing to do, Insha, is go to the IFSQM forum and, and post on there and get some input from... The different members yeah um, i can yeah i can say that um and i hope nobody gets mad at me because there are people all over the world here but in my opinion fssc 22000 fssc 22000 is going to be the lead standard in the world of food and it's going to overpower brc ifs sqf and others throughout as time and there are certain several reasons for that but i'm not going to go into them that's my own prophecy that's what i think is going to happen and uh if i were to consult an organization i would advise to adopt fscc 22000 and learn that standard because it does include the requirements of everybody else and is gfsi benchmarked and is it is also um departmentalized there's one for agriculture there's one for packaging there's one for uh, animal feed there's one for human food there, and so it's yeah. not better. I'm not trying to get in trouble, but I foresee it being more more popular. Yeah. 
Okay, on that note, uh, you, you probably saw us as well interspersed there. Lots of good feedback for you, David. So uh, a lot to get my, through in an my hour. My pleasure. But uh, I really appreciate your time today, David. Thanks very much. Okay, everybody, have a great weekend. Get vaccinated. Keep your distance and stay well. <laughs> See you. Thanks, David. Bye, bye. Okay, ladies and gents, final thing. I'll issue your certificate in the sidebar that you can um, go and download. It's uh, an image file. So you can either print and sign it or you can open it, in, open it in an image editing software such as Microsoft Paint and put your name. So you've got to add your own name to the certificate. Uh, we'll be following up with an email in two or three hours with the slides, the recording, and the certificate also. Okay, so thanks for your attendance today, and thanks for joining in and making it a very engaging topic uh, for David and myself. So thanks very much. Have a lovely weekend, everybody, and uh, take care. Okay, bye.